Okay, I think we're, I think we're going here. Yep, good stuff. All right, hi class. This is, it's me. I'm trying to look a little, less, a little bit less like I've just been uh, zoning out in my house. So put on a nicer shirt and a sport coat here for you. <laughs> last day of last day of class sessions through the the Zoom lectures. So you'll be most of you will be watching this um, for Friday, April twenty fourth. And we'll, we'll obviously spend our time today um, finishing up the 21st century, so far anyway, with, with films up till the year 2019. So just, uh, just a couple of reminders. You, you probably are pretty well aware by now, but just remember that you have your greatest director critiques due on Monday at the latest. So, um, and I'd appreciate if you could submit those by 5 p.m. I'm kind of, I'm um, spacing out some of my submissions for classes on Monday because it's actually a pretty full day. So I'm hoping to to get some things downloaded and then uh, off my, my email submission um, prior to five. So it would help if you'd, or excuse me, after five. So it would help if you could get those to me by 5 p.m. on on Monday. So don't forget to do that. That's a actually a hundred point grade because you're you're going to be writing a fair amount uh, about the particular director that you choose, and in essence, kind of making your case for why they are the greatest. So I'll I'll look forward to reading those, and then that will conclude the semester. So just FYI, as we move through the last seven to ten days or or so, um, I would I would say I should have final grades posted. Uh, no later than May the, the second or third, but if it ends up being May the fourth, please hold off on the emails, you know, the emails of, hey, where's my grade? I promise there, there's an awful lot for me to get through, so I'm, I'm definitely going to be grading an, an awful lot of stuff, including senior thesis papers for, for my history students, and those are, you know, some of them are going to be about 35 pages in length, so I've got a lot to comb through. Um, Anyway, just keep that in mind. Okay, let's get cooking here. Let's talk a little bit about some movies, and I want to make sure that I that I have them all lined up according to my notes because I forgot to the other day. So, one of the films I forgot. So this is a shout out to to you, Kellen Matheson, if you are watching this video. Um, I remembered because you you actually mentioned this film earlier in the semester, and it's one that that my family and I watched and absolutely loved. It's called The Peanut Butter Falcon. And it's just a, just a really engaging, fun, um, you know, dramatic film at times too, but it's, it's just a really inspiring, wonderful film. It is obviously, if you watch the film, you'll notice pretty quickly that it's paying homage to, to Huck Finn with this, especially with the journey on, on the water. Uh, and, and yet there's obviously a, a modernized story at the heart and core. Shia LaBeouf plays Tyler, who's a very troubled man who's been through a lot of trauma in his own life. And he's kind of, he's trying to iron through that. And he crosses paths with, <laughs> with just this wonderful, engaging young man named Zach, um, who's, you know, the, actually the actor's name is Zach and the character's name is Zach as well. And he's, he's a young man who has Down syndrome and, uh, you know, struggles with that reality of his life. And uh, he, he's living in a, in a facility as we start the story and, and then breaks out and runs across Tyler. And, and the two begin to form a really strong friendship and bond. And the story goes forward from there. And I, I love the fact that, uh, that Zach, who's who has Down syndrome, um, is is just so delightful and fun in the film, and you you discover that the title of the film is actually based on his his, his love for pro wrestling, especially uh, pro wrestlers from you know bygone eras. Then and, and so he his wrestling name is is Peanut Butter Falcon, 
And uh, anyway, I'm not going to spoil spoil the movie for you. I would highly recommend it. It's a very well tailored, um, you know, very. I, I wouldn't say it's overly complex because it isn't, but the performances are great. The storyline is is actually pretty magnetic. It it has a very uh, very powerful charm despite the simplistic narrative. So I would highly recommend it to you. Um, Kellen, there we go. I'm paying paying your uh, your articulation of your love for that film, paying that homage as well. So there we go. I uh, have to have to always be um, you know raise my my compliments to the Matheson clan whenever and wherever I possibly wherever I possibly can. So okay, let's talk about uh, let me go here. Let's talk about the two films that many of you have, I've already seen a bunch rolling in. Many of you actually went and did the, the comparative film review of Silence and A Hidden Life. So I do wanna spend about 10 minutes or so, 10, 12 minutes talking about that before we move on and, and deal with some other films. So, you know, as I thought about the semester, I wasn't sure if I was gonna incorporate um, A Hidden Life and and silence in this specific way. Moving forward, I may make this kind of an official part of the course, but, but uh, since the semester had already started, we went with extra credit assignment. And, and both films, by the way, so Scorsese and, and Terrence Malick are, are both, uh, you know, masters of filmmaking. They're both geniuses. And I really, really, you know, love both films. Uh, of the two, I, I am more profoundly inspired and influenced by A Hidden Life, and I'll get to that in a minute, but I don't wanna downplay the artistry and the significance of silence based on the Shisako Endo novel, Japanese, one of the great Japanese writers of the late 20th century. And, and Scorsese is, is intent on, as he tends to do, he's intent on raising questions. Uh, a lot of that film is based on you know, what does it really mean to live a life of dedicated faith? And is it possible, as we see these characters in the film, is it possible that in our, in the most arduous, challenging, difficult moments that someone can, uh, can seem to compromise themselves and yet uh, find that that's not true, that Christ is still with them through thick and thin and they have not lost their witness or what have you. So a couple of things. Uh, this, the Scorsese film Silence, it's, it's based on, as I said, the Endo novel. And I want you to note that in both cases, I posted some commentaries. So first and foremost, I want you, instead of walking you through the same exact things that he says, uh, because I agree with them and I think they're excellent, but I love, I love uh, Bishop Robert Barron's critiques of film oftentimes. He's a, he's a Catholic priest who is extremely thoughtful about our interactions with culture and he's also particularly knowledgeable about films and I love his critique of Scorsese's silence. So just boiling it down to simplicity, I'm not going to go through every argument. The The film ends with with the the key character in the film is is played by Andrew Garfield and the character's name is Rodriguez and one of his Companions, Garupe has already been killed earlier in the film, and um, and we see Rodriguez struggling once he meets his former mentor, a man by the a priest who formerly went by the name Ferreira, played by Liam Neeson in the film, and Rodriguez is is just extremely traumatized by by meeting him in the film because he is he has apostatized, he has given up the faith, and he has taken on a Japanese name and lived a Japanese life. And, and it is, you know, there's a heart-wrenching scene where he starts to, to convince Rodriguez that it's just fine to apostatize uh, in public, uh, given the pressure that he's being put under. Earlier in the film, we see that, that Rodriguez and his young companion priest, uh, Garupe, that they are successful in in ministering to uh, groups of indigenous Japanese Christians who have just recently come to the faith. So much so, uh, and I think it's one of the most moving pieces in the film, 
we see that the Japanese Christians, the Japanese converts are, are prepared to, to give their lives and, and to not refute the faith and to not uh, condemn it. Some of them, um, you know, some of them step on the fumier, which is the image of Christ that, uh, that the, the Japanese authorities place on the ground for, for Christians to, you know, to, to commit this act of apostasy. Apostasy, there we go, it's a tough word to say, I guess. Uh, and, and we see that some of the Japanese converts initially struggle with this, but in the end, uh, there's a powerful scene where three of them are condemned to die. They're, they're actually crucified uh, in the water where the tide comes in on shore, and, and they die these very slow, arduous, painful, difficult deaths, and yet there is it's just unbelievably inspiring, especially as, as one of the young Japanese men is, or one of the Japanese men is dying on this cross. He's singing hymns in the Japanese faith to the Lord. And it's just very moving. We go from that to the end of the film where Rodriguez actually does go through and he apostatizes. He steps on the image of Christ, believing that he hears the voice of Christ speaking to him and telling him that it's okay to do so. And so this is the key question in the film, and, and Bishop Barron walks you through this. And I want you to watch what Bishop Barron says about what we're supposed to think and not think and the questions that are raised. And, and basically, he talks about the famous ending sequence, the clips that I posted of silence, I want you to watch. Then I want you to watch Bishop Barron's uh, his editorial comments on silence. And he'll comment on the last scene in the film where we're ostensibly, at least, we're led to believe, well, even though Rodriguez apostatized and, and repeatedly does so over the course of, of his life living in Japan, taking on a Japanese name and a Japanese wife and family, at the end sequence, we're led to believe, well, he still maintained his devotion to Christ. It was just totally private. It was internalized completely for fear of being found out. And, uh, you know, who are we to say that that, that uh, you know, that dedication wasn't somehow there? That's, um, for lack of a better way of putting it, that's essentially what Scorsese's film says. Okay, contrasting this with A Hidden Life, a couple of things that are going on here. So Hidden Life is not, in the, not set in the 17th century like Silence is. It is set in the World War II era, but it's based on a, a real story, a real life narrative, uh, the life of Franz Jagerstadter and his wife Fanny, who live in uh, an alpine village in Austria. And, and they see their lives changed dramatically as the, the Nazi menace begins to take hold in Europe, beginning in the late 1930s and going on into the 1940s. And, and the film is, is, first of all, they're both, you know, they're both just beautifully made films. Uh, and I, I actually think the cinematography in Silence is impressive. I think there are moments of beauty and grandeur and, and there are some really beautiful, poignant moments in that film. A uh, Hidden Life, honestly, because it's Malick, I expected this. Terrence Malick is famous for his his visual integration, uh, the, the natural environment. He integrates thoroughly and well with all of his films, and he does that overpoweringly in this film uh, with the Austrian landscape, but with the, the connection to the grandeur of the Lord and his creation. It's certainly part of fe a huge feature of the film. The musical score um, is also just just unbelievably beautiful. A lot of a lot of hymns, uh, a lot of uh, Christian classical compositions that are thrown into the mix. Some Bach, some Mozart, um, some Vivaldi as well. And it, it's just, it's glorious. It's just the production alone is beautiful, but the story is very powerful and it's, and it's very revealing. Jagerstadter and his wife uh, are, are experiencing 
the onset of the war as Austrians and, and they see their fellow Austrians absorbed by the Nazi propaganda and many go right along with it, including some of the, the priests who they know and respect. And Jager Stadter's conscience just preys upon him. And ultimately uh, he is asked to go to war after coming back from some training exercises, he's asked to go to war and commit himself to the formal cause of Nazism, and he refuses to take the oath pledging allegiance to Adolf Hitler. And he does so knowing there will be some consequences, but I, I love the fact that this film shows a number of different consequences. There are real consequences for him and for his family. So he is, once he takes that formal stance, he is put in prison by the Nazis and he's transported to different prisons throughout the rest of the film. And this is in sharp contrast to the life we see that he and Fanny were living, this, this uh, glorious, uh, close-knit family life as farmers up in the, Austri uh, you know, up in the Austrian Alps. Uh, this the famous sequence in the film says, we lived above the clouds and in, in, you know, just this a uh, very, not perfect, of course, but a harmonious existence for the most part. Uh, just very grateful for one another and great, very grateful for their children and for their faith in the Lord and the, the beauties that surrounded them in their village and their relationships and everything else. And that is all contrasted sharply with what comes after Jagerstadter refuses to pay homage to Hitler and refuses to take that oath. And the consequences are, are certainly there, but one of the great things about the film is that Malik is, is showing what really you know, comes to light with, with Jager Stadter and his wife and their experiences. Uh, their, his prison time is, is very difficult to watch. There are moments of violence. There, you see that there's a psychological element. Many of the people in, in his life and in his wife's life back home in their Austrian village you know, they become pariahs. They are outcast because of Jager Stadter's decision. Many of the villagers believe that he's being, he's actually, and very ironically, that he's being, uh, you know, that he's essentially a traitor to, to Austria because of his refusal to take part in, uh, you know, Adolf Hitler's war and that he sold out his own villagers in a sense. And, uh, and so poor Fanny, who's still back home, takes the, the abuse here from many of the villagers. Uh, so that part of it is coming to the forefront. Many people, including his own priest, many people that Jager Stadter consults who are Christian, tell him, hey, look, why, why do this? Who's going to notice? Who's going to really care? This isn't some act of devotion that's going to be recognized. Nobody's going to see this as an act of conscience, it's not going to have any effect, so why bother doing it, in essence? And in the end, it is, you know, Jagerstadter falls down on, on his life of faith and on his on, on scriptural precepts, and he follows through with his conscience and what he knows to be right, and he takes a stance against what he believes thoroughly and well to be evil. And, and he essentially lets the chips fall where they may. And there, there are a number of beautiful, inspiring sequences, but the one that I posted deals with Fanny, who's finally allowed to come and see him at the tail end when he's in prison. And she, she, um, she exhorts him to do what is right. And she says, I will, you know, I'm with you. Do what is right. And it's, you, you get this, you, you almost see, Certainly there's pain and, and there's agony because this is their last parting from one another on earth. But there's also a sense of relief that, that washes over uh, Franz Jagerstadter at that moment. And, and it's just powerful. So in the end, uh, A Hidden Life concludes something very different than what we seem to be receiving from the Scorsese film, uh, From Silence. And I posted another article this one by a, a guy I've actually met a couple of times. I don't really know him. Can't, I can't claim him as a friend. He's more of a, a very light acquaintance, but his name is Brett McCracken. He graduated Wheaton and, uh, and is now writing for the Gospel Coalition. 
and he does a lot of film reviews. And I posted his review of A Hidden Life because I think it is it is spot on. And I didn't, I don't have the time to write a, a similar sort of review myself at this moment. And I found it and I thought it was just spectacular and it aligns almost almost exactly with where my thoughts were going on these two films, particularly the Jagerstatter figure whose life is much more aligned with Bonhoeffer and the whole notion of what surrender means, true surrender to everything God commands from us, the surrender in whole, the surrender of ourselves uh, to, to the commands of scripture, to the commands of God through prayer. And and I, just, I love what, what uh, Brett McCracken wrote. So here in the end, and, and if you guys didn't reach the same conclusion, I'm not gonna you know, beat you up with uh, the extra credit assignment, but here's, here's where this ultimately falls. I think in some respects, I would say, you know, if I'm trying to measure this, I would say that a hidden life exists as the ideal and, and striving for a life that will reflect Christ and will honor him and will not be ashamed of him. And, and this is the ideal we are to be striving for. And sadly, very few, very, very few human beings, past and present, have had the, the courage, uh, the noble courage to follow through and live out the ideal, especially in extremely trying, excruciating circumstances. There aren't that many Dietrich Bonhoeffers and Fr uh, Franz Jagerstatters and you know, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego's out there, right? And, and I think that, that has inspirational power, that film, for those reasons. We see the ideal. Silence strikes me as a powerful study, does raise some very interesting questions. But it, it strikes me as the, the reality, in some respects, for where many of us might actually fall. We'd like to think that we wouldn't, right? We'd like to think that we'd hold firm. And in that film, we'd hold firm. In the silence film, maybe we'd hold firm like the Japanese converts do and die for the faith rather than, rather than uh, cast the name of Christ to the side and, and declare publicly that we don't believe. But I think many Christians would do exactly what Rodriguez did under extreme excruciating pressure in particular contexts when there are voices around them telling them it's okay. Just this is just a this is gonna release you. This is gonna be a statement that is just fine for you. And uh, you know, like Bishop Barron concludes, as you will see, uh, that this is this is kind of where I'm falling on the films. They're they're both wonderful uh, film. There just aren't enough faith-based films of this power and magnitude made by expert filmmakers, master filmmakers at the height of their craft. There's so few and far between. Um, the the so-called Christian films that often are released in you know the last 15, 20 plus years are are just so cliched, often almost all of them. There are a few exceptions, but they're almost all so cliched and poorly filmed, poorly acted, and, and it really kind of is grating. It gets on my nerves and the nerves of many. And so when, when these kinds of thoughtful, thought-provoking and inspiring, especially in the case of The Hidden, Hidden Life, these inspiring films come to the forefront, I think you know, it, it is like a, it's like a balm of some sort as far as connecting elements of faith in a powerful, good, affirming way, uh, you know, it's, it's actually very, you know, a very positive experience. So I like both films. Uh, in fact, I really, really like both films. Uh, if someone asked me to, forced me to choose, I would say A Hidden Life is, is the one that really stands out as a, a genuine masterpiece of film. And it's really interesting that two, <laughs> the two most profound faith-based films of the past decade have both been by the same director, I might add. And I'm 100% in agreement with what Brett McCracken wrote, because if you haven't seen A Hidden Life, see it. And then there's another film from 2011 made by Malik called Tree of Life, that is profound 
<laughs> it is, it is uh, just, just really a beautiful film about faith. All right, guys. So we're going to move on, but I wanted to to touch base with those and mention a few things. Hold on a second. I've got to come back to my – make sure that I don't gloss over anything here. All right. Whoops. So silence, hidden life. Ah, yes. Okay, we've got to move on and talk about some other films here. Um, so I didn't create a, a slide with – at least I'm not sure. I don't think I did. No, I didn't. Okay, so there are a couple of films uh, that I just want to mention. I didn't create a bunch of slides for them, but I think they deserve they deserve strong mention. Two of they're both sports related films, and and there's another one that's kind of on the side. I would say is uh, kind of honorable mention. So maybe I'll just do that one first. Uh, Ron Howard's film Rush. Which uh, which details the uh, the lives and the and the competition between two uh, Formula One race car drivers, European race car drivers, and uh, played actually, you know, if if you've never seen Chris Hemsworth outside of his roles as Thor or some of these other films, I think you'd really appreciate Hemsworth Hemsworth's performance in Rush. Uh, he really embodies his character, or the, the English race car driver that he plays. And then uh, his counterpart, uh, the character's name is is Nicky Lauda, very famous race car driver who experiences a horrific accident and probably should have died in a car wreck. Um, it, it's a it's a really dramatic, uh, exciting film, and I think it deserves to be mentioned. I'm not, I mean, I'm I'm a bit of a petrol head or a uh, motorhead or whatever you want to call it, gearhead my, myself. I love cars. Um, have have so have so really loved cars my whole life. So maybe that just speaks to me. I'm not really sure, but uh, it it really did capture a lot of attention from audiences. So I just wanted to mention it in passing. The other two films um, I want to mention, I think, uh, have deserve a lot of attention and maybe maybe even more than they got, which is saying something because they're they're both very well done. Um, the, the first film is so Ryan Coogler film. And, and I think it, it just signaled for everybody that, that as a director, he was ready to take the reins from some major studios on some enormous projects. And it's, it's the film Creed from 2015. Of course, uh, Sylvester Stallone reprising his, his ancient role as Rocky Balboa is is a key part of the film, but we have Michael B. Jordan's character. So uh, he is, we discover he is the son, the illegitimate son of Apollo Creed, the, the black fighter that Rocky first defeated and then became friends with, who was, who was ultimately killed in the ring in Rocky IV. And so we rejoin this story and, and we discover that Apollo Creed had this son named uh, Adonis goes by the name Donnie and and Donnie is a searcher he's had a hard life and he's he's actually the, I, I, there's so much um, th there's a, a real real strong I think even better than some of the drama that we would have seen in some of the previous Rocky films I think this film brings the the life of Rocky together with the life of Donnie so thoroughly and well we also get Apollo's um, widow brought into the brought into the storyline, and she is she's just a wonderful lady. She she essentially adopts Donnie and uh, has, allows him to come live with her, and uh, as a young boy, and and obviously there's a strong connection between the two of them. Um, this this film was really kind of cathartic for a lot of people. I, it it just brings the whole Rocky story into the present very effectively. It pays homage to a lot of the the past plot lines, but it also reinvigorates the whole Rocky franchise in a very different way. And we are we're just so um, you know the audience is drawn into the growing bond between Rocky and Donnie. We see them kind of 
you know, keeping each other at a distance at first, as you would expect, but this bond becomes real. The friendship becomes not, you know, not only about training and boxing, it becomes thorough and real. They become kind of adoptive family to one another throughout the course of the film. And the sequence that I posted that really highlights this is when Donnie discovers that Rocky's been diagnosed with cancer. And Rocky, because he's Rocky, Rocky figures, well, I've, I've lived a good life. What do I have to live for at this point anyway? So I'm just not going to get chemo and I'm just going to die. And that's okay with me. And, and Donnie comes to him and he confronts him and he's, he essentially says, you got to fight this. And what Donnie's trying to say, that he doesn't really come right out and say at first is, hey, you know, I really care about you. You can't just, you can't just assume that you have nothing to live for. You have to live for, for a lot of things, including, you know, including me. And it's, it's a great sequence. And it's, it's actually Sylvester Stallone, a reminder that Sylvester Stallone, although he's played a, a lot of pretty one-dimensional tough guy roles, that, that Sylvester Stallone has, has some depth and dimension to him when it comes to acting. And I wish that, that he'd done more of these kinds of films and that he'd been given more sequences uh, when it comes to stuff like this. Because he's really, he's really great throughout the movie and he's particularly strong in a couple of those sequences. I love the film. It's, it's certainly a sports film in a sense. It's a sports drama, but it is, it's very well made. I think it's, it's honestly better than, uh, than either all or virtually all of the Rocky films. You could argue that the first Rocky film has some equally intense dramatic power. And that's, you know, I think there's some truth to that, but, but this one has, has just catapulted for me and has catapulted to the top of some of my favorite sports films. It's just great. The other sports film I want to mention in passing just came out this past year and it's called Ford versus Ferrari. So another car film. Uh, shoot me if you don't like the fact that I'm bringing another car film up here. What are you going to do about it? What are you going to do about it? Um, and I love it. it. It's it's a great film about Carol Shelby and and the fact that, you know, they, in order to to run the the famous Le Mans race in France and to actually compete that the Ford Motor Company has to go back to scratch and create their own car. Um, and they bring in Carol Shelby, played by Matt Damon. Shelby, one of the famous car makers of all time, one of the famous car innovators of all time. Uh, if you've never heard the name Shel Shelby before, uh, you know, just go ahead and Google the, the Shelby Cobra Mustang and, and all sorts of stuff will come up. So, um, so Shelby and his, his friend driver, Ken Miles, uh, it reveals their, their relationship, their friendship, their working partnership to create this, this car that, that goes up against some of the most revered car companies in the world, especially European car companies, but specifically goes head to head with the Ferrari, with Enzo Ferrari's famous cars that are all built by hand from scratch, right? They're not factory built cars. Uh, and, and it's, it's a very engaging, fun, um, and fast moving film at times, but it, there's definitely some dramatic power behind it. So I'd highly recommend it to you. Okay, we've got to move on and talk about some others. Okay, um, yes, some, some sci-fi that we haven't gotten to yet. So I wanna make sure that we do. So some sci-fi films. Um, look, there are some great ones in the 21st century. We've already covered some in the first decade and the second decade is populated by some other great films. And I'm actually gonna start with one that I do not think has been understood very well and has not garnered as much attention as it probably should have. And part of it is because of my, my um, appreciation for the late Mr. Ebert and for um, you know, the, the opportunities I had to, to interact with him in Colorado. So, you know, I, I think his review of the film Prometheus, which came out in 2012, which was, which was marketed as something of a prequel to, to Alien, to the Alien franchise films, 
uh, marketing execs in the studio, they, they just did not do the film any, any service, any, any favors by, with their marketing campaigns, which made outlandishly, made it seem like Ridley Scott's whole purpose with the film Prometheus was to answer every possible remaining question about where the aliens come from and, and if were they, who created them, you know, what, what how did that all come about? I mean, the, all the questions that people were asking about the alien beings from the earlier films. And that's not at all what Ridley Scott was setting out to do. And if you take the film at its, you know, on its own, if, and if you just look at the framework that he's presenting, it is, it is meant to ask some, some questions, some very important worldview questions, right? Framed through science fiction, I might add, of course, this is not a Christian film. It's not meant to be. Um, it, it is very interesting in that it, it's essentially an alien seeding film about uh, the, the idea that uh, really, in a sense, it's interesting that Prometheus brings the whole question of naturalism very, very much into the center because its premise is that, <laughs> is that alien seeding was, was the reason for life. And you see that even at the very beginning sequence of the film. For starters, it's just an absolutely gorgeous sci-fi film. Uh, it is so so convincingly shot uh, the the sequences um, on you know in space, but also the sequences on the the planet are just uh, very convincingly created, and the shadowing, the colors, the mixture of the colors is gorgeous. So just from a cinematography perspective, it's it's awesome. But the storyline is very impressive too, and and what you'll see if you watch the film is that far more questions are are brought up and that's that's intended by Ridley Scott in the film and you you come to discover an, a number of things that in fact the there is sort of a a master race of beings who have have gone around the universe seeding life on planets um, but and and we're not this question isn't answered in the film but we're led to believe that there they were somehow that these beings these planetary engineers were somehow dissatisfied with with the life on various planets and and they apparently were experimenting with bioweaponry and the bioweaponry that they were experimenting with were you know uh were aliens so nasty little buggers that that can kill you and unfortunately for them the bioweapons and very very poignant for the moment we're living living through right now very very much uh, a parallel association right the questions swirling right now about where the coronavirus came from was it accidental was it engineered we don't know yet maybe we won't ever know so whatever but this film is bringing up you know this question and, and it starts to reveal that these engineers were beset by their their horrid creations and were set upon by them and and in a panic we see at the very end of the film the sequence that i posted there is this realization by the protagonist in the film played by numi rapace and she's she's discovered oh no the the engineers intend to go and wipe out life um, including life on Earth, by the way, by using these these nasty bioweapons. And so the sequence that I posted is her begging the pilot of the, you know, the remaining crew. <laughs> the others had all been killed, so the remaining crew, there are only a couple of them left, begging the captain, played by Idris Elba, to go and crash the Prometheus spaceship into the alien spacecraft as it's leaving the planet and, and starting to head up into the atmosphere and it, it brings it crashing down. And it's a, it's a really impressive sequence and actually the film itself is rather impressive. Um, aud the complaints by critics and audiences alike seem to be based on those who, who apparently aren't prepared to to uh, let the synapses fire and allow their brains to function at all during the course of watching a film. I'm not really sure why or how, but it, it actually is sci-fi at its very best, and I would highly recommend it to you. Okay, a couple other films I wanna make sure I'm not forgetting. Um, oh yes, Ex Machina. 
Okay, so I, I do have that one on here, and I also have even that we've talked about some others. We've talked about Inception and the island and Avatar, and talked about uh, briefly talked about Minority Report. Um, Looper deserves some honorable mention because of Ryan Johnson helmed that project and it really catapulted him to to the forefront of the industry. It's probably why he was given re the reins to Star Wars Episode Eight, which arguably didn't go very well for Ryan Johnson. But Looper is a very interesting film and it deserves deserves to be watched. There's no question. I love J.J. Abrams. Uh, he's I mean, he tends to make nowadays he's making some pretty mainstream stuff, but he's also very creative. And one of my favorite films by by Abrams is technically sci-fi. It might actually be more, uh, it might more accurately be described as a monster film, like a throwback 1950s era monster movie, right? A, a Saturday matinee monster film called Super 8. I'd highly recommend it to you. I'm not going to explain the plot line here, but it's it's a fun, fun, engaging uh, sci-fi monster film. Ex Machina is a, which by the way, just means the machine. So it's Latin for the machine. So Ex Machina is a is a very thoughtful film. It is a it is a thinking man's sci-fi piece, and it like films along the lines of Blade Runner, Blade Runner twenty forty nine, Gattaca, right? Another great sci-fi film from the nineteen nineties. The, these films are probing, uh, you know, deeper truths about humanity and and raising questions, raising issues. And in Ex Machina, the, the issue to be discussed is the issue of what makes us human. It is whether or not uh, a being can be created that has full cognizance, artificial, truly artificial intelligence. And so this film deals with, you know, brings that whole question to the forefront through these two characters, Nathan and Caleb primarily. And Nathan his creation named Ava, who is a robotic organism. And, and the question becomes, all right, well, are, is, is Ava to be considered human? She, she wants to know if she should be considered human. She probes that question. Uh, the, the Turing test is the set piece for this. A uh, very interesting test about what it, you know, is AI actually in existence? And so the, the character Caleb in the film is brought online or brought on board to investigate whether Ava has actually achieved AI, whether she is, is really cognizant. Very clever. It's also uh, the, the tension builds throughout the film and the, the ending sequence, which I will not spoil for you here. The ending sequence is very revelatory. And we, we see in a, uh, almost like a, a 2001 HAL fashion, we, we see the capacity of the machines that, that have been created in the film, specifically with Ava. I would highly recommend it to you. Okay, and then lastly, I, you know, I, I, have not, I have not as thoroughly enjoyed either episode eight or episode nine. I, I didn't dislike episode nine nearly as much, but I, I didn't love episode nine of the Star Wars franchise. However, uh, you know, I've gone back a few times over the past few years and I've rewatched Star Wars episode seven, The Force Awakens. And, you know, it's grown on me a little bit. I don't, I still don't think it is a great sci-fi film, but I think it's a pretty good one. And it, it did breathe new life into the Star Wars franchise after the, the somewhat disappointment or the somewhat disappointing legacy left by the prequels uh, that came out in, in uh, the first part of the century. So, which took a beating from critics and, and fans alike in many respects, even though in all three of those films, episodes one through three, there were sequences that were very interesting and well done. Broadly speaking, there were so many narrative problems and acting issues and, um, you know, very, very one dimensional characters and undeveloped plot lines and all sorts of, just a lot of issues. So, you know, I think audiences were, were just so eager for a film that they could attach themselves to that at least was a decent to a, to a good film. And I think Force Awakens certainly stands out as a good film. Um, I still think 
uh, episode four and episode five are the benchmarks. They're far and away the best of the whole series of, of nine major films. I love uh, Rogue One, a Star Wars story as a side film, a set piece, a kind of a, a you know, an extra film in the franchise really does some interesting things. I really enjoyed it. But this one was well done. And, and the, the scene I posted is one of the great ones in the film where, where Ray and Finn are forced to, to steal the Millennium Falcon and try to escape the planet Jakku. And they're flying around trying to, you know, evade the TIE fighters that are chasing them down and flying through the remnants of a Star Destroyer and things like that. Uh, a lot of fun sequences in the film. Uh, Harrison Ford wanted to be removed from the franchise, never to never to be filmed as Han Solo again, and he got his wish. Very much frustrating to a lot of Star Wars fans, myself included. But um, other than Han Solo's death in the film, I really did enjoy it. So it's it's another film I, I think does deserve to be mentioned in the sci-fi universe. Okay, fantasy films. So this is where we're going to end. And I just want to make sure that that I pay homage to a couple of really good films. The first one I want to mention is actually Midnight in Paris. And, and because I knew I would be running out of time, I, I posted something that I'd be running short on time. I posted another uh, another commentary on Woody Allen's Midnight in Paris by Bishop Robert Barron, because I, I think, again, he nails the film. I think what he has to say is, is spot on, in some cases actually quite profound. I love the film. It is, it's a romantically themed film, but it's definitely a fantasy film as well. It's, it's uh, you know, there are films like Groundhog Day that, that kind of border, but, you know, cross the border between comedy and fantasy, right? So I would say that that Midnight in Paris definitely does the same. It's it's romantic. It has some some genuine romantic undertones to it, some overtones probably as well. But it's it's wonderful fantasy as as the character played by Owen Wilson discovers as he's in Paris with uh, you know on this vacation this break he's he's able to to live this very interesting alternate reality for a time as he encounters Paris of the 1920s. And he's, he's rubbing shoulders with the likes of F. Scott Fitzgerald and his wife Zelda and Hemingway and Cole Porter. And I mean, just a whole slew of great characters. And, and it is, it's a great vision that is presented and I'll let you watch what Robert Barron has to say because I like it and uh, he walks you through a few minutes where he just explains the film. I would highly recommend it. I think it is a beautifully made film. I, in my opinion, Woody Allen's best effort since probably going back to films like Manhattan in 1979 or even Annie Hall, 1977. So one of my absolute favorite Woody Allen films for a lot of different reasons. So please watch what Bishop Robert Barron has to say. And then of course, we can't end, you know, end our semester and end with the fantasy film genre in the early 21st century without acknowledging the power and the influence of the Harry Potter series. I loved reading the books. I thoroughly enjoyed watching the movies. My personal favorite, I have to say, and I didn't mention a whole lot about it when we were talking about the decade of the 2000s, but my personal favorite is probably Harry Potter and the Prisoner of Azkaban. I think that is a, it is a, um, it is an excellent film. I think it is the best in the series, but I also love many of the other ones too. And so the, the one I posted is just a perfect wrap up to, to the stories as we finally, after at long last, the culminating battle between Harry Potter and Voldemort in, in the last film. So the, in the Deathly Hallows part two, so which, which comes out in this, this past decade that we just completed. And, you know, so much is being brought to bear in that sequence as we think about the sacrifices that have been made, as we think about the, the, th the major changes that have come about in the lives of our three main protagonists in the film series, Harry, Ron, and Hermione. As we think about their families and friends, as we think about uh, the ways in which 
um, the, the whole notion of good versus evil, the battle between good versus evil has been framed in the novels and in the films as, as, we, are, as we are forced to recognize how many, uh, you know, many are duped by evil. And there are certainly some of those that come to the forefront in the last you know, the last film, the last book of the Harry Potter franchise. And, and then there's, you know, then there are the sequences that involve characters we weren't, you know, many of us actually probably wanted to hate. And we come to realize, as J.K. Rowling intended, that people are very complex. And so, um, obviously, we learn more and more and more over the, over the last couple of stories and movies about Dumbledore. Uh, we learn an awful lot about a character that was easy to hate, and that is Professor Snape in the film. And I think there are some really interesting complexities that are brought to bear in, regarding his life and his, his attachment to Harry's mother, uh, and by extension, his desire to, to run interference for Harry. And, and ultimately, he pays, you know, he he's, uh, pays the ultimate price with his life as Voldemort kills him. And so the, all of this comes together in the last film and this sequence, uh, we've, we've been anticipating a culminating battle and it all comes together very convincingly and well in the film. So really excellent fantasy framework, really, really excellent work. And that folks is where we're gonna wrap things up. There are some other great films that I, you know, I'm not gonna have time to get into so I'm trying to highlight, my, my goal has been to highlight some of the great directors and films from these decades. Uh, and we've, we've gone through quite a few. So I hope this has been helpful as a synthesis. Uh, good for you to, hopefully you've been taking some notes that you can then apply. Um, I, I think as we, as we move through the course of our lives and try to contend with worldview and film, uh, this is, I think, one of the more important aspects of the course for me as we identify the, the worldviews that are behind the movies. And the Brian Godawa book was intended to help us help you do that as you move forward. Okay, so uh, we're done. Thank you for taking the class, and I hope the experience has been a good one for you. Remember on Monday to submit your greatest director critiques and please do that by five so I can actually catalog them and get them off my, my inbox before I have a whole slew of other things coming at me. I think that's it. So have a good rest of your day once you watch this and uh, I hope your summer goes well. You can be looking for your final grade probably around May 4th. Uh, May could be earlier, but probably somewhere about May 3rd or May 4th. Okay? All right. Bye-bye.